خصوصا على افضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الامين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد we begin with Allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam brothers and sisters in Islam here at Masjid Darul Ihsan in Subang Jaya in Kuala Lumpur assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh our topic tonight is a fascinating one one that will arouse and arrest attention one that is very pertinent for the time in which we now live it is Imam al-Mahdi and the end time let us begin with that hadith with which you are all familiar you know which one the ten major signs of the last day and if you've not memorized it as yet I suggest that you memorize it before you leave the masjid tonight the companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam were sitting talking amongst themselves when he the messenger of Allah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam came and asked what are you talking about and they said oh messenger of Allah we are talking about the subject of the alamat al-sa'ad the signs of the last day of the end time and then he said as only a prophet could say the last day would not come until and then he mentioned ten sign these have come to be known as the major signs I don't know who coined that term but there are many many others beside these ten for example when next you go to KLCC you see some of these he said that the naked barefooted shepherds oh they don't like this language at all the naked barefooted shepherds will be competing with each other in the construction of tall buildings in other words an age will come when men will measure progress not by how faithful you are to Allah and his messenger not whether you are following Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam or following Dajjal no they will measure progress by how tall a building we can build let those who have eyes open their eyes and see and those who have hearts use their hearts to understand he said that women would be dressed and would yet be naked and so next time you go out and you see them like that your heart should shiver with fear how did he know it 1400 years ago in the desert a man who never traveled the world how did he know that an age will come when women will abandon the hijab how did he know that women would be dressed and yet be naked and there are so many more but tonight we return to those ten which are known as the major signs number one and they have not been given 
in the chronological sequence in which they will occur. No. Number one, Dajjal, the false messiah, al Masih al Dajjal. Number two, Gog and Magog, and I have just written a book on Gog and Magog. It's the last book I wrote, an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world, and I want someone, tonight I'm asking you, to translate this to Bahasa. Come on, somebody. Number three, the return of the son of Mary, Ibn Maryam. And so when that fellow in the place called Kadian in India declared that he was the fulfillment of this prophecy of the return of the son of Mary, the true Messiah. You know which one I'm talking about? A man named Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, founder of the Ahmadiyya movement with which Washington is so much in love and London is so much in love and Jerusalem is so much in love today. When he declared that he is the fulfillment of that prophecy of the return of the son of Mary, we say to him, and I don't know why he runs away when we ask the question, how come you are the son of a Punjabi woman? <laughs> Number four, <coughs> Dukhan. Smoke. And if you read this book on Gog and Magog, I have offered an opinion. And let me repeat it one more time. When Imran gives an opinion, never accept that opinion. Unless and until you are convinced that it is correct. But I have the right to offer an opinion. Provided that I recognize that only Allah does not make mistakes. So we say, Allahu alam, Allah knows best. That this dukhan or smoke is coming. Maybe 20, 25 years from now. When the cataclysmic clash with nuclear weapons occurs. Between Gog and Magog between the American-led alliance and the Russian-led alliance. And you don't need a PhD in international relations to know that we are moving towards that clash. Thousands of nuclear weapons exploding. Can you imagine the clouds, the mushroom clouds? Number five, the battle up. Or the beast of the land. Ard is material universe. Ard is the earth. Ard is the land. For example, Al-Ardul Muqaddasa, the holy land. My opinion, that beast is already here. It's the state of Israel. And Allah knows best. Number six, that the sun would rise from the west. I have given my opinion and I have the right to give my opinion even if 999 differ with me that's their right. Why deny me the right of offering my opinion? My opinion comes from my primary source of guidance is from the Quran not from some textbook of electricity and magnetism and polar magnetism. The Quran tells me that the sun rises from the east and I gather that in Malaysia it also rises in the east. And the Quran tells me La tabdila li khalqillah that Allah's creation does not change. And so I have chosen to understand the hadith, not literally, but symbolically. That something is going to happen which would symbolize 
a false sunrise from the West. And I have understood that to be modern, godless, decadent, oppressive, awesomely deceptive Western civilization. And Allah knows best. Number seven, eight, and nine. Three earthquakes resulting with movements of the earth in which the earth sinks down, chas, and swallows what it swallows. One in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Arabia, and the third one is linked with Imam al-Mahdi. And number 10, that the fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to their place of assembly. Of these ten, the Quran singles out one. And Allah says of that one, the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, wa innahu la ilmul lissa'a, it can be read that way, or la alamul lissa'a, it can also be read that way. Perhaps that ilm and alam here are synonymous. Il means knowledge, Allah means sign. That this is the sign of all signs. The return of the son of Mary. Nabi Isa alayhi salam. The most powerful voice in history ever to have prophesied. The return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. The return of Jesus is the voice of Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Even if we did not have the ahadith, it is still possible using the Quran alone to establish belief in the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And so if you reject belief in the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam you will not be able to understand the end time no no matter how great a scholar you may be there is a branch of knowledge which studies and explains the end time in Bahasa in Malayu you call it ilmu akhirul zaman and in the English language we call it Islamic eschatology don't bother with the big word Islamic eschatology since we now have the tall buildings I don't know whether you have missed it if you have take a taxi to KLCC you'll see it the evidence is there as plain as daylight that we are now living in the end times. And so it is Islamic eschatology which will explain the world today, not the New Straits Times and not your local television station, not even your government. It is Islamic eschatology which will explain the world today and at the heart of Islamic eschatology or ilm al zaman is the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam let me repeat that if you reject belief in the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam you can't guide Muslims in this age no because you cannot yourself understand the reality of the world in the end time. We now turn to a hadith in Sahih Bukhari. In which Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said, and it is a very short hadith, you can memorize it before you leave the masjid tonight. كيف أنتم 
How will you be at that time? Oh, what a wonderful time that would be. إِذَا نَزَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ نُمَرِيَمْ When the son of Mary will descend amongst you. Oh, so he's not descending in Rome. Oh no. When the son of Mary descends amongst you, whether they like it or whether they don't, when Jesus comes back, he's coming to us. He's descending amongst Muslims. كَيْفَ أَنْتُمْ إِذَا نَزَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ نُمَرِيَمْ وَإِمَامُكُمْ مِنْكُمْ And at that time, your imam would be from within your own ranks. He would be a Muslim. And so there is an imam in the end time. And the advent of that imam, I'm going to use another big word now. First one was eschatology. <laughs> the advent of that imam will be contemporaneous. Long word, huh? <laughs> contemporaneous, meaning at the same time with the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. The advent of that Imam would be at the same time with the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. But he would have to come before. And then after he has come, then Nabi Isa alayhi salam will come. Who is that Imam who will emerge in the end time? And who is an Imam? And what will be the implications of the emergence of an Imam at that time? These are fascinating questions. We have to simply leave Sahih Bukhari and go to Sahih Muslim and we get the answer that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam prophesied that that Imam would be known as Imamul Mahdi, the rightly guided Imam. And we also are told that he is going to be from the seed of Muhammad. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam From his daughter Fatima Radiallahu ta'ala anha So he's going to be an Arab I don't think he can be an Indonesian Huh? Or Malaysian? He has to be an Arab eh? Okay This Imam who will emerge at the time when Nabi Isa alayhi salam is to return is not only from the seed of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, but we also have a description of his physical features a broad forehead and a large nose and so on and we also know something about his functions that at that time the world will be filled with oppression. Well, it has already come. Modern Western civilization has now been hijacked to deliver to the world more oppression than mankind has ever witnessed. And yet there are those who have eyes and yet cannot see. And their Qibla is in Washington. And they long to get a green card and a U.S. passport. So I say, please go and don't come back. Please go and don't come back. You don't belong to us. You belong to the Jamaat of the oppressors. At that time, there will be oppression in the world. All over the world. And he, this man, 
will break those chains of oppression and bring justice to the world. So this is going to be a revolution, a revolutionary change to transform a world filled with oppression to a world of justice and of peace. And then the world would experience what Islam has to offer. This would be an Imam who would come at a time of great poverty and destitution in the world. Well, it has already come. All those who stand up to Dajjal are today miserably poor. And all those who are faithfully following Dajjal are living in the comfort zone. That's what the Prophet prophesied. But when the Imam comes, he's going to share wealth to the people. Would it be US dollars? The last thing I heard about the US dollar was that it was in ICU in some hospital. Would it be the French francs or the Malaysian ringgit? Come on, wake up and stop this nonsense. Stop this nonsense. If you did not know it before, maybe tonight you should start to learn that knowledge may enter into your head. The money that we are now using has come from the job. If you have not studied international monetary economics, come to me and I'll teach it to you. The money that we are now using has come from the job. The paper currencies have come from the job. The electronic money which is taking over from the paper currencies have come from the job. And they are functioning as an instrument, not only for the unjust transfer of wealth from the unsuccess unsuspecting masses to a global predatory elite, but more than that. They're bringing a system of slavery upon the world. Enslaving mankind. And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam prophesied that in the end time there will be slavery. He said a slave woman. You remember? Don't you? He said a slave woman will give birth to her mistress. We have a conference in PWTC on Tuesday and Wednesday. If you could take two days off, leave, come join us. In the, there's a flyer outside about the conference. It is on the prohibition of riba in Islam. Hmm? Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam told us that that Imam is going to share wealth which kind of money? Oh you know it. I don't have to tell you. It's the money which is in the Quran. When last did you open the Quran and look in the Quran to see whether there's money in the Quran? Huh? Is the dinar in the Quran? Yes it is. Is the dirham in the Quran? Yes it is. That's bad news for some of you who have neglected the Quran. And so he's going to share dinar and dirham. Money that Allah ordained to be used as money. And if we had been using that money, Indonesia would not be miserably poor today. And Egypt would not be miserably poor today. And Bangladesh and Pakistan and Afghanistan would not be miserably poor today. And Africa would not be miserably poor today. He will share that money to such an extent that no one would be willing to accept zakat. What a world that is going to be tomorrow. This Imam is called Imam. But the word Imam here is synonymous with Amir or leader. So he is not only Imam al-Mahdi, 
he is Amirul Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers. So would he be the head of the Egyptian Muslims alone? And you have another one for the Malay? Another one for the Indonesians? Huh? Or is he going to be the leader of all Muslims? Come on, answer me today. Answer me today. You know, he prophesied about the end time that knowledge will disappear. Knowledge will disappear. And here's the evidence. That when that Imam comes, he is going to be Amirul Mu'mineen. So then what are you going to do with your Egyptian citizenship? A new Egyptian passport. I don't want to go further than that. What are you going to do with your constitution of Egypt? And your Syrian constitution? Your pledge of loyalty to this state? Huh? What are you going to do? I know what we are going to do. We never gave up in our heart. We never gave up in our hearts loyalty to the Imam and to the Amir. No, we never gave it up because we never accepted the substitute. And we will never accept the substitute. He's also known not only as Imam, not only as Amir al Mu'minin, but also as Khalifa. Khalifa. And this brings us to our difference of opinion with the Shia. We hold the view that the Shia are Muslims. Oh yes. And we gave evidence to support that. There is no fatwa which has achieved ijma'ah. No. Because the Shia have performed the Hajj continuously to this day. No one has stopped them. And so the ijma' of the Ummah is that the Shia are Muslims. And if they are Muslims, then you have to relate to them as brothers. Ruhama'u baynahum. And if you defer with them, you must defer in a way which is constructive and not destructive. Hmm? We say that the first Amir, the first Imam, the first Khalifa was Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then after him was Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And after him was Uthman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And after him was Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we have said and we have not spoken with hostility and bitterness and enmity. We have spoken with sadness in our hearts. That if you declare of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that he was a usurper who stole somebody else's position. We say that you are misguided. If you are annoyed with us, what can we do? But facts are facts. And we say that if you say that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was also a usurper, we say that's double misguidance. And if you compound that by saying that Uthman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu was also misguided, we say, come on, it's time to wake up from your sleep. And we're not speaking these words with bitterness and with anger and with hostility. We're speaking these words with sadness. And it's because we call them the khulafa that we say that the Imam who is to come will also be Khalifa. What is the implication now 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending to us a khalifa and saying to him that he will be from within your own ranks. Kaifa antum iza nazala alaykum numaryam wa imamukum minkum and your imam will now be from within your own ranks. Very clearly to me, this hadith is anticipating a time will come when we will no longer have khilafah. No. That we will be ruled by those who are not Muslims. There is no authentic Islamic rule anywhere in the world today. Because those who rule us are not Muslims. Where is the evidence? When last did you take up the charter of the United Nations organization? And if you are in Iran and you listen to this lecture, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Take up the charter of the United Nations organization and open it and read, I believe it is 24 and 25. But I can be mistaken. I've been traveling for five months now, so I can make mistakes. It could be 24 and 25 or 25 and 26. Where the Charter of the United Nations says, in effect, in effect, that in all matters pertaining to international peace and security, Allah is not Al-Akbar. No. The Security Council of the United Nations is Al-Akbar, meaning there is no authority above it. That is shirk. And so once you are a member of the United Nations organization, your Amir al mumineen your Khalifa, <laughs> your leader, your ruler, ultimate ruler is the Security Council of the United Nations. Hmm? And so you can call yourself an Islamic Republic, like Pakistan used to do before it became an American Republic. And I don't say this to ridicule the Pakistani people because I studied in Pakistan and my heart beats with the people of Pakistan who are imprisoned in Pakistan because they don't have the freedom to choose their own leader. Their leader is chosen in Washington by the Zionists. And so a time is going to come when we, are not, we will be ruled by those who are not from within our own ranks. So you had Amir al Mu'minin, George Bush. <laughs> but that's not going to last forever. No. When Imam al Mahdi comes, that's goodbye to the substitute that they gave us for the Khilafah. Dajjal gave us the modern secular state. And the modern secular state has replaced the Khilafah. And all of mankind, illa masha Allah, have pledged their allegiance to the modern secular state. Loyal to the modern secular state and to its constitution. And as a consequence, have said goodbye to Allah and to the Khilafah. But you and I have not done that. In our hearts, we are faithful to Allah and to His Messenger. And in our hearts, we are faithful to Islam's model of a political state, the Khilafah. And in our hearts we long for that day when the Imam will emerge and the Khilafah will be restored. Is it possible for the Khilafah to be restored before the Imam emerges? There is a hadith in Sahih Muslim 
that a Khalifa will die. And there will be disagreement concerning succession. I think you already guessed who it's going to be. Hmm? There will be disagreement concerning succession. And then a man will emerge out of Medina. Remember Medina, eh? not Jakarta. Medina. <laughs> And he will hurry to Mecca. And the people of Mecca will come out to him and urge him and try to force him to accept the bayah. No, we have problem here. We have heard this word for years and years and years and years. The word bayah has been put in something called the cold storage. So we've got to go to the cold storage now and pull it out. What is this bayah? It is the pledge of allegiance which legitimizes the rule of the Khalifa. That is bayah and it is an institution that is located in the Quran and in the Sunnah of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. When he accepts the bayah, at that time he will confirm and proclaim himself to be Imam al-Mahdi. Now then, I made this comment and I did not make this comment in any disrespectful way. No, I was merely speaking facts and if Imran is not allowed to speak facts what should he talk about I said that Mecca has never been a Shia city is that true or is that false tell me I never said that there are no Shia in Saudi Arabia now you come to hit me with a left uppercut for something I never said? Please have some respect for your own intellect and don't quote people wrongly. What I said is that Mecca has never been a Shia city. Is that true or is that false? There is nothing to suggest to us that that situation will change in the future and that Mecca will transform itself and become a Shia city there is no evidence to support that and therefore we ask how can a people of Mecca who are not Shia how can they go out and pledge allegiance to a Shia If you have an answer, I'd be happy to get the answer. You can send me an email. And I am not wearing any boxing gloves. No, this is not the age for that. This is a reasoned discourse that is being presented tonight. And so I conclude that the Imam cannot be Shia. This is my conclusion. If you defer with me, that does not mean that we should have boxing gloves fighting each other. No. The argument is raised that because the Prophet ﷺ used the word Khalifa, a Khalifa will die. The implication is that the Khilafa will be restored before the advent of Imam al-Mahdi. But have you forgotten that hadith with which we, were, we began? كَيْفَ أَنْتُمْ إِذَا نَزَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ نُمَرِيَمْ وَإِمَامُكُمْ مِنْكُمْ Why should the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam say to us that this Imam will be from your own ranks when we already have the Khilafah? It has already been restored. 
and our imams are already from our own ranks why should he say that my understanding is that the hadith is clear that prior to the advent of Imam al-Mahdi it is not possible to restore the Khilafah no and therefore when the word Khalifa is used a Khalifa will die the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam is referring to a Muslim ruler who could it be? oh the answer is clear <laughs> It has to be a Saudi king. Because there are 5,000 princes out there waiting, struggling, fighting to take over. And there's already sufficient evidence of internal conflicts and rivalries within the big Saudi clan. Hmm? So, a Saudi king will die. It can't be Fahad because he's already dead. <laughs> would it be Abdullah I don't think so and I'll let you know why in a moment when that Saudi king dies and there is disagreement concerning succession it is at that time that Allah will send the Imam is the Imam born already this is not arrogance on my part no when I say I don't know and I don't want to know so please don't send me emails asking me whether the Imam has been born already what is important is that Allah places a cover and Allah conceals him and no one knows that he is the Imam until that moment arrives when the king, the, the Khalifa dies and there is disagreement and so on then he proclaims himself to be the Imam until that moment we don't know who is the Imam so is he born already? no come on I don't know and I don't want to know having disposed of these questions now what are the implications of the advent of the Imam the first and major implication of the advent of the Imam is that the substitute that Dajjal had created to replace the Khilafah that substitute your modern state will now return to the garbage bin of history from where it came out in the first place why do I use such harsh language what is the Khilafah state the Khilafah state is a state established for the first time by Nabi Dawood alayhi salam in the Holy Land the Holy State of Israel restored in Medina by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam the Khilafah state is a state which recognizes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Al-Malik Al-Malik they translate Al-Malik as the king whereas in political terminology it should be translated as a sovereign so sovereignty in the Khilafah state resides with Allah the modern secular state which came from Dajjal says no no Allah is not Al-Malik sovereignty does not reside with Allah sovereignty resides with the state the state is sovereign the people are sovereign not the Lord who created them you don't need a PhD to understand that that is shirk 
And that's the one sin that Allah will never forgive. For those of us who just have a few steps left before the grave, it's a wake-up call for us to make tawbah before it's too late. The Khilafah state recognizes Allah's authority as supreme. He is Al-Akbar. The modern secular state says, no, the authority of the state is supreme. There is no authority above the state. And the states are all organized under the United Nations organization. And the United Nations organization is, has as its top the Security Council. And the authority of the Security Council of the United Nations is Al-Akbar. Not Allah. Dajjal created that. And instead of worshipping Allah, we are worshipping Dajjal. The Khilafah state says that Allah is Al-Hakam, the supreme law maker. His law is the supreme law. And when he says haram, no one can make it halal. And when he says halal, no one can make it haram. And in Surah Tawbah, there is a verse of the Quran which declares that to be shirk, to legalize and make legal what Allah has made haram. That is shirk. The modern secular state says, no, Allah is not Al-Hakam. Parliament is Al-Hakam. Parliament makes the law. And the law that comes from Parliament and the law that comes from the United Nations is the supreme law. The modern secular state says more than that. If I am wrong, would you kindly correct me? The modern secular state says that Allah can make it haram, but we can make it halal. And everything, or almost everything, because we have not reached New York as yet. In New York, they now legalize the marriage of a man with a man. In New York, they have now legalized the marriage of a man with a man. And yet, you want, this, you want your green card, eh? To become an American citizen, eh? So go and stay there and never come back. Those are your people, not ours. The modern secular state says Allah can make it haram, but we can legalize it. Shall I give you some examples? Would you be interested? Yes. Did you know that... Allah prohibited money being lent on interest. Did you know that? Huh? You know that? And did you know that Allah has declared war? War? On the lending, money lender lending money on interest? Did you know that? And did you know that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam has cursed? Cursed all four? and declared that they are all equally guilty. The one who takes riba, the one who gives riba, the one who records the transaction and the two witnesses. The one who takes riba, the one who gives riba, the one who records the transaction and the two witnesses. Did you know that he said that riba is constituted of 70 different parts, hadith of Ibn Majah? That riba is constituted of 70 different parts and the smallest part of riba is equivalent to a man marrying his own mother and do you know what the modern secular state has done even in Saudi Arabia all around the world they've made it halal don't believe me there's something called a bank outside there in Subang Jaya. Go and ask them whether they lend money on interest. 
ask them whether it is haram or halal in Malaysia to lend money and interest. Go and ask them. I can go on and on and on and on. This is a substitute for the Khilafah. But let me say something more. In the Khilafah state, so long as we Muslims have control over territory, that territory is designated Darul Islam. Now look at that. That's another term I have to take out of the cold storage. You better keep the lid open for me. Darul Islam. And in Darul Islam, every Muslim has the right to enter. All that you have to do is to declare La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And you have the right to enter. You don't need a visa. In Darul Islam, every Muslim has the right to enter. You don't need a visa. So Indonesia is 90 something percent Muslim. So I go to Indonesia, I present myself before the immigration officer, I read my hands, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Immigration officer looks at me, where has this fellow come from? He says, where is your visa? Show me your visa. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah can't work here. Are you understanding the situation? In Darul Islam, every Muslim has the right to reside. You don't need a PR, it's called, permanent residence, PR. Huh? Very difficult, eh? PR. No. Once you're a Muslim, you have the right to reside. In Darul Islam, every Muslim has the right to seek his livelihood. You don't need a work permit. I told you, he said, that in the end times, knowledge will disappear. This knowledge has disappeared to such an extent that now some people cannot even digest it. They don't agree with it. No. In Darul Islam, every Muslim has the right to participate in the political process. The political process in Islam is called the Shura. On the basis of equality with all other Muslims. You don't need citizenship. Hmm? This is Darul Islam. That substitute has divided us, broken up Darul Islam, and replaced it with something that is very bad. Let me use a soft language. Very bad. Very bad. And so in 1988, when I came to Malaysia for the first time, I was the principal of the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies in Pakistan. And uh, the the Muslim, what is it called? An, Is an Islamic organization in England, Muslim Institute for Research and Planning, founded by our dear brother, Dr. Kareem Siddiqui Rahimahullah. May Allah have mercy on the soul of our dear brother. The Muslim Institute in London and Pati Islam in Malaysia combined to organize a seminar in Hajj, on Hajj. And I was chosen to come from Pakistan to, to be one of the speakers in that seminar. And I said it, that it is wrong to take the Islamic movement and register it as a political party and fight elections under the constitution of a modern state that has come from Dajjal. Pass was not too happy with me. <laughs> no. 
The same thing was done in Pakistan by Maulana Maududi Rahimahullah with the Jamaat Islami. The same thing was done in the Arab world, the movement founded by Hassan al-Banna Rahimahullah, the Ikhwan al-Muslimun. That you take the Islamic movement, you register it as a political party, and you fight in elections under a constitution of a state created by Dajjal, built on the foundations of shirk. That is not the sunnah. Well then what is the sunnah? And what is the guidance from the Quran? When you studied this book on Gog and Magog, when you studied Ilmu Akhiru Zaman, Islamic Eschatology, and my book entitled Jerusalem in the Quran, most of you probably already read this book. It was written 10 years ago. It has, it qualifies as the textbook on Islamic eschatology, and we now have it in Bahasa. We have it in Bahasa outside. When you study the subject of Ilmu Akhiru Zaman, then you understand that the proper response to Dajjal, Dajjal's money, Dajjal's economy based on riba, Dajjal's political system based on the modern secular state and its shirk, and the Security Council of the United Nations as al -Akbar. The proper response is to flee from Dajjal. To flee from Dajjal. And to try to restore the micro khilafah, wherever you can. Until the time comes when the macro khilafah can be restored, when Imam al-Mahdi comes. That micro khilafah, I have described as the Muslim kampung, the Muslim village. Huh? And I know that I'm out of Dajjal's reach. When I go to a kampung where I cannot use a cell phone. Now I know I'm out of his reach. Hmm? Over there we will try as best as we can to restore dinar and dirham as money in the market. And we will not use this bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper and electronic money. In that kampung we'll try to restore the amir and the bayah. And we will refuse to give our allegiance to the modern secular state. And we say this is micro khilafah, waiting for macro khilafah when Imam al-Mahdi comes. This is not a place where you will be opting out of jihad. Oh no! That the baby boys who are born in this kampung will fight better on the battlefield from Khorasan in the Muslim army that will liberate the Holy Land. The baby boys born in this kampung will fight like lions, much better than yours from KLCC. So the Muslim kampung is not a place to go and sleep. Now then, we come to a very unfortunate event. One of the outstanding scholars of this age, and now my remarks are directed particularly to Pakistan. One of the outstanding Islamic scholars of this age was a man named Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. I recognize him as a great scholar, and I recognize him as a great poet. Unfortunately, my knowledge of the Farsi language and the Urdu language is not good enough to appreciate the beauty of his poetry. But I don't have any problems with his poetry. 
what a problem that I have is with what he has wrote, written in the English language. And I have more than a passing acquaintance with the English language. Dr. Iqbal argued in a book which he published entitled The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam, which most Pakistanis have not read. And those who do try to read it probably give up before they finish two or three pages because you need a whole bottle of Tylenol tablets for headache. Iqbal is writing pure philosophy. I have a master's degree in philosophy and for me it's a headache. So much less for you. I admire the first two chapters a lot because in the first two chapters of that book he takes on the job. You know the one eye and the two eyes? The epistemology of the modern West. And Iqbal has delivered the best defense of the epistemology of the Quran that has ever been written. But very few people can understand it. So those first two chapters are written in gold. But elsewhere, the, um, Iqbal has made this mountain of a mistake in declaring that the modern state he calls it the Republican state. Actually, it's a secular state. The modern state, he says, can function as a substitute for the Khilafah. That's wrong. And if we say that our teacher made a mistake, we are not disrespecting our teacher. No. He still remains a great scholar. We still respect him. We are not disrespecting him. When we say that this Iqbal has made a mountain of a mistake in declaring that the modern secular state with its parliament can be a substitute for the Khilafah. Iqbal then compounded that error by agreeing with Ibn Khaldun that all the ahadith on Imam al-Mahdi are all fabricated. Now don't come and tell me what Iqbal has said in Urdu poetry. No, don't come and tell me that. I know what he said in Urdu poetry. We're talking about what he said in English. And the impact of Iqbal's thought on the Pakistani intelligentsia. Iqbal does not believe in the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. No. Iqbal does not believe in Dajjal. No. I ask you, how can you beat the drums of Iqbal in Pakistan today to extricate Pakistan from the mess in which it is? He is not the answer. Yes, there is much we can learn from him. Yes, Iqbal can inspire our people with his Urdu verse. But Iqbal in English is not the guide to take the Pakistani people out of the awesome predicament in which they are. And so I... When Imam al-Mahdi emerges at that time, the Gog and Magog war will take place. This book explains it. An Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. And if one, one person will have to come forward and volunteer to translate here to Bahasa, inshallah. At that time, the clash takes place between the American-led alliance, the Russian-led alliance. The nuclear war takes place with thousands of nuclear wars, nuclear weapons exploding. I think that will be the moment when this verse of Suratul Isra will be fulfilled. Suratul Isra. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the warning, Wa im min qaryatin illa 
nahnu muhlikuha qabla yawmil qiyamah aw mu'adhibuha adhaban shadida kana dhalika fil kitab mastura it is as though you're hearing the verse for the first time because you've never heard the verse in the context in which it's being given now and not a single city will escape none they will all be destroyed says Allah all and those which escape destruction will be punished with terrible punishment and this is a matter inscribed in the kitab maybe that if you're out of electronic range you know the cell phone you will not be incinerated this is the end of modern western civilization dominance over the world maybe another 20 25 years that's all we have to endure this is the end of the modern secular state and all the patriotism it demands of us and this is the time when Darul Islam will be restored whether they like it or whether they don't this is the time when the Khilafah will be restored this is the time when Imam, Imam al Mahdi will rule over us the Shia who follow him at that time are our brothers the Sunni who follow him at that time I don't think there'll be many Sunnis following him they will say he's a terrorist our brothers and so Shia and Sunni both following the Imam will constitute the Ummah of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. when will that happen how much time is there left let us attend to this and we'll then end the lecture Imam al Mahdi cannot emerge until Allah ordains that he must emerge. So, no government has charge over this. <laughs> when will Allah ordain that he must emerge? Hmm? Because as soon as he emerges, he's going to head for Makkah and he's going to pro proclaim himself the Imam. Uh, an army will then march against him from Sham and that army as it crosses Medina going south to Makkah will be swallowed by the third Khas one in the east, one in the west, one in Arabia when that army is swallowed by the earth that is the validation that is the conclusive validation that this man is indeed the Imam not eclipses in the sky the sinking of the earth when that army sinks down into the earth and is swallowed then the Abdal from Sham and Al Iraq will come to the Imam to offer bay'ah. The Sufis have hijacked this word, Abdal. So I got to take it back from them. <laughs> I got to take it back from them. And they say that the Abdal are some mysterious people. They're always only 40 of them and so on, and they have the bowl in their hands and so on. Abdal means when one dies, another one replaces him. This one dies, another one replaces him. This one dies, another one replaces him. The Abdal. So if you're listening, Washington, let us introduce you to the Abdal. When you don't have any more money to buy people from, white people from South Africa to go and fight for you in Iraq and in Afghanistan, you know, white South Africans when you have no more money to offer bribes of green card and citizenship to get people to go and join the American army to go and kill Muslims you're running out of soldiers I want you to know Washington that we will never run out 
we will never run out because when one dies another one takes his place and when he dies another one takes his place these are the words of Muhammad these are the Abda they are the Mujahideen who are waging a just struggle for liberation from oppression and liberation from occupation of the land they will now come to give the bay'ah to Imam al-Mahdi Imam will now be attacked from an army of the Quraysh said the Prophet an army of the Kalb and he will defeat that army would it be a Saudi army? looks very much like that to me looks very much like that to me but Allah knows best when he defeats that army then Jaziratul Arab oh another term out of the cold storage see good thing we left the door open eh? Jaziratul Arab when last did you hear that term Jaziratul Arab is the Arabian Peninsula today it has been hijacked and there is an obnoxious name called the state of so no sorry the kingdom of Saudi Arabia squatting squatting so there will be no more kingdom of Saudi Arabia it is Jazeera to the Arab will be restored and when Jazeera to the Arab is liberated then Darul Islam is restored this is the implication now tell me would you release Imam al-Mahdi into the world when the Zionists have read all of these ahadiths they know it all would you release Imam al-Mahdi into the world before Israel replaces the United States as the ruling state it doesn't make sense no would you, re 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 would you release Imam al-Mahdi into the world before Israel rules the world and Dajjal is in his day which is like a week you have to read this book Jerusalem in the Quran to understand that Israel is about to launch her big wars either this year or next year attacking Pakistan to destroy the nuclear plants and nuclear weapons attacking Iran attacking Egypt so you can occupy the territory from the river Nile to the river Euphrates hmm? if you want to know why there's a book outside entitled the religion of Abraham and the state of Israel a view from the Quran my view and Allah knows best is that Allah will not release Imam al-Mahdi into the world until Dajjal has completed his mission or oh, he is very close to completion of his mission and so Dajjal has to be born he has to be born of Jewish parents he's not been born as yet but he's already created modern western civilization because he's already released into the world he's already released into the world he's close to the end of his mission but he's not as yet been born as a human being when he's born as a human being he'll be a Jew he'll grow up to be a young man he'll be powerfully built he'll have curly hair he'll rule the world from Jerusalem and then he will proclaim I am the Messiah al Mahdi um, al Masih and when they accept him as al Masih he can rub his hands and he can say come on help me mission accomplished I've given them a six for a nine I've deceived them and now they've been taken to the greatest destruction that they will ever experience in history but no Israel and so by my calculation and Allah knows best we are still probably another 20-25 years away before that event occurs 
when Imam al Mahdi will emerge. Finally, I want to remind you about the conference on Riba. Uh, there's a book on Riba outside, and there's this little book. You have no excuse, it's so small. The Gold Dinar and Silver Dirham Islam and the Future of Money. Many people have been asking, where did Imran Hussein study? Who was his teacher? What kitab did he read? Uh -huh. Because we don't hear anybody else speaking like this. If you want to know more about me, you can begin by reading this very interesting book, The Islamic Travelogue, which is outside. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim. وَتَبْ عَلَيْنَا يَا مَوْلَانَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَابُ رَحِيمٌ بَرَحْمَتِكَ يَا أَحْمُ الرَّحْمِينَ أَمِينَ